Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by Inside the Penguins, a proud affiliate of the Hockey News. I'm your host, Nick Belsky, joined as always by Nick Horwat, and we well, we had a great show planned for you guys today, and we still have a great show for you guys today, but it's not going to be as originally planned because we have a bit of breaking news to start off the show. We'll talk about that in just about a minute, but after that, obviously, talking a little bit about what Kyle Dubas had to say in Buffalo at the NHL Scouting Combine. It looks like he might be staying put on defense, something that has been hinted at over the last couple of weeks, and that train just keeps on rolling here as we get closer and closer to free agency. And then we'll close out the show updating you on the latest and greatest of the Stanley Cup final. A former Penguin lights the lamp multiple times in Game 2. We'll talk about that tremendous performance from a player that it probably should have been on the Penguins this this season, but you know we digress to that point. But let's kick things off, Horwat, with some breaking news as of this morning. The Penguins are reportedly hiring David Quinn to fill the role left vacant by Tard Reardon at the end of this past season. David Quinn, obviously a, a noted best friend or one of the best friends of Mike Sullivan. I called. I went so far as to call him. Mike Sullivan's great value brand Mm -hmm. at this point earlier today. But according to Arthur Staple of The Athletic, he will be the next assistant coach of the Pittsburgh Penguins. What are your instant thoughts on the David Quinn hiring? My instant thought was this is exactly what we expected uh, from the moment uh, before even Todd Reardon was fired. uh, There was the ideas of who's going to be the next assistant coach. Who's going to take over for Reardon? Maybe Volucci as well. Uh, David Quinn was just at the top of that list immediately right away for everybody considering the connections with Sullivan, considering the uh, connections with Eric Carlson from being San Jose's head coach uh, last couple seasons, considering the there's more to it that I'm not coming to right now. Oh, just how about that he's he went to Boston College or yeah, BC uh, or was it BU? Sorry. Whichever one it is. He was in the bean pot somewhere. He, yeah, he went to one of those Boston universities with Mike Sullivan. I get them confused. And Fenway Sports Group is the ownership group here. So uh, the, the Boston ties are running deep. Uh, the w- one, more, one more weird hire, and it's not a weird hire. It's actually pretty good, I think, for the Penguins. But one more weird hire by the Penguins. Next thing you know, the coaching staff is going to sound like Fenway Park on an any given Thursday. So it's uh, – it's a good time in in Pittsburgh. I enjoy the uh, if this is if this holds up. I am enjoying this. I think sometimes those expected uh, selections are because they're the top candidates as well. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, the the connections are going to be there, um, but when it also makes a ton of sense, it gains a little more traction. And I think for this situation, David Quinn having head coaching experience. Um, having the connections, moving to a different role could be good for him, could be good for the team. And there's a reason why that flame kind of kept going for this hire. Yeah. Now I'm not going to throw the the five bell alarm out there. I'm not going to try to dunk on David Quinn before he's even actually hired. This is just a yes. report as of right now, nothing official from the Pittsburgh Penguins as of yet, uh, potentially with an announcement coming later today. But, you know, Arthur Staples is a pretty credible source, so we're going to run with it here that David Quinn's coming to the Penguins. But here's the one thing that I mentioned about this assistant coaching search. Whenever it kicked off, whenever Todd Reardon was fired, I said one thing I would like to see is Kyle Dubas bring in somebody to challenge Mike Sullivan, somebody to make Mike Sullivan's seat a little bit hotter, to make him a little bit more uncomfortable, to bring in new ideas. This feels like a carbon copy of Mike Sullivan to a certain extent. So that doesn't do any of those things that I wanted this assistant coaching hire to do. Not to say that it's not going to work. Not to say that David Quinn can't be a very solid addition to the Penguins organization. All I'm saying is it doesn't do what I would hope that this hire would have done. Again, that was just my direction. That was my thought going into this entire process. But uh, the hiring of David Quinn, it's certainly, I don't even want to say interesting. It's not interesting. It's the expected outcome. We both had tweets out there from April saying, well, as soon as David Quinn was fired, expect him to be on the short list in Pittsburgh. And that was before Tar Reardon had even been fired. Reardon was fired on the first week of May. So it's not surprising at all, and I, I will say I'm a little disappointed that it ended up going the 
obvious route, but at the same time, whenever the answer is in front of your face, sometimes you just shouldn't try to deny it. Yeah, it's it could be a good choice too. You never know. You don't know how the dynamics going to work when they get there. The good buddy cop relationship going on behind. I'm telling you, there's gonna be too many jokes that come out of these two being best friends, both being from the area uh, and coaching a Fenway owned team. I, I, this is going to be an incredible meme season. Maybe if this, if things work out well with these two, um, I'm excited for it though. Again, a new hire is going to be no matter what a fresh start for everybody, everyone involved. Yeah. It doesn't push Mike Sullivan to be a better coach. Doesn't make his seat warmer, which I'm with you on that. Maybe this hire should have done that, but also remember there's still an AHL position to fill. Now, does that automatically mean whoever they hire for the AHL spot is going to be that push for the NHL head coaching role? Like it has been the last couple of coaches or two of the last three coaches. You never know. Um, but that's something to keep an eye on as well, that that spot still needs to get filled. And mm-hmm. he, that's a name that could push Mike Sullivan. Just depends who they get down there. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, coaching hires are coaching hires because as we've seen, especially this past year, look at who's in the Stanley Cup final. Sometimes that replacement doesn't have to come from within the organization, even mm-hmm. if that change is made mis- mid-season, obviously reverencing Jay Woodcroft and Chris Knobloch of the Edmonton Oilers, but you, you mentioned it. It's going to be a little bit of a, a circus because how many times are we going to see that college photo with Mike Sullivan oh. and, and David Quinn? We're going to get it on the Penguins broadcast. You're going to get it on every national broadcast. So the first TNT game, the first ESPN game, probably not just the first ESPN game, but probably the first three ESPN games because they like to recycle those stories sometimes. Uh, but at the end of the day, we'll see what it does. If it at the end of all of this, it ends up helping the Penguins, then sure. But at the same time, you're bringing in a guy that is not a pupil, not a disciple, but very close to your head coach. So similar to what the Pittsburgh Steelers did yesterday, this is another seemingly vote of confidence in a beleaguered head coach in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, Not surprising that both front offices have chosen to back the guys that have been widely considered one of the best in the sport and yet have not found a lot of success past the regular season in, in recent memory. But David Quinn reportedly coming to Pittsburgh as the assistant coach. One more coaching vacancy left to fill, as you mentioned, Horwat. That is the assistant position, or that is the head coaching and the assistant position down at the Wilkes Barre Scranton Penguins level. But let's move over and talk a little bit about some news that was made over the weekend by President of Hockey Operations and General Manager Kyle Dubas. Let's face facts here. The Penguins were not a good defensive team last year. And if you think otherwise, you're lying to yourself. They were bad all year long defensively. Partly why Todd Reardon was let go and why David Quinn is now on his way to the city of Pittsburgh. And yet it appears that there's not going to be a lot of change to the personnel on the back end, which makes it interesting. Letang, Patterson, Carlson, they're all safe, right? Mm-hmm. Over the weekend, Letang and Carlson were named as part of the core of this team. And then Pedersen's the only other name out there you're not trading your best defensive defenseman. It's just not happening, even if he's in a contract year. Jack St. Ivan, he just signed a three-year extension. He's not going anywhere. Ryan Graves, every report out there is, well, the Penguins were disappointed in what Ryan Graves did, but no one's going to take that deal. They're going to give him another year. Everybody and their mother has echoed that sentiment over the last six weeks, so you start to believe it is fact. So if Ryan Graves is not going anywhere, and now you look at the one last piece of the puzzle that hasn't been signed in and locked in for next season. That's P.O. Joseph. It looks as if they're looking to get P.O. Joseph back. He's currently a restricted free agent. Rob Ross, you reported that the Penguins were pleased with his play with Latang down the stretch of the season and pleased with the improvements that he made throughout the season. And now this from Taylor Haas of DK Pittsburgh Sports. She asked Dubas directly in Buffalo about P.O. Joseph and his future with the organization. And this was the direct quote. Quote, Director of Hockey Operations Vuki Mapofu and his agent had some conversations already. So I think we're going to try to get that wrapped up. If we can, he's got arbitration eligibility, if not. So it'll come to a conclusion one way or another, but he'll definitely be somebody that we'll qualify. So it sounds like the band is almost entirely back together. Horwat. Sometimes general managers are a little playful. Sometimes they throw things out there to try to throw everybody off, not just in the local media, but across the National Hockey League. 
Do you think the Penguins are actually going to run back the same group in 2024? They just might. As much as we may have discussed changes to the Penguins' blue lines, as much as we may have looked at possibilities for swaps or for trades or for free agent signings on the blue line, it was always going to be tough considering you're not moving off of Carlson or Latang. You're definitely not moving off of Pedersen. Okay, then what? You got youngsters like John Ludwig and Jackson Ivany Jackson Ivany that you don't quite want to move off of yet. Uh Pierre P.O. Joseph, you have a decision to make. Maybe you could they maybe they tried to try to trade him at the deadline. Maybe it was, you know, he was due for a change of scenery this summer. Who knows? But it sounds like they're gonna qualify him and now he's in place. And like we said with Ryan Graves, as much as the Penguins might try and move him, are who's taking it? And how much would you have to retain for a team that doesn't want to retain? So when you look at it, yeah, it makes sense. It all of a sudden makes sense that they're not going to make any changes, that they just can't, that they are just sort of not stuck, but hopeful everyone finds their rhythm. I mean, Carlson and Latang, Carlson mostly found his rhythm toward the end of the season. Latang is, Chris Latang is going to be perfectly fine, <clears throat> albeit maybe time to push back to a second line role discussions to have later this summer. Uh, Marcus Pedersen is going to keep elevating his game. He's going to keep getting better for a couple seasons still, and he's going into a contract year. You're expecting great things from him. P.O. Joseph, like you said, the Penguins liked what he brought to the table at the end of the season. They liked what Jack St. Ivan he brought to the table, let alone they when he played John Ludwig, they enjoyed him and Ryan Shea still needs a deal. We'll see what happens there. All those names are players that the Penguins liked, and each of them showed promise. Notice how I've left Ryan Graves out of this out of that conversation. But again, they're hoping for a bounce back. They're hoping for something better. So all of a sudden, you're looking at it and going, there's votes of confidence all over this blue line from yeah. management. And in my eyes a little bit, I'm hoping for a bounce back from Ryan Graves, if he can bring that, because he's been a top four defenseman everywhere he's played. He's 29. He still has time to... to sort of cement some more in the defensive scheme of the Penguins. Um, suddenly you're look at it, looking at it and going, fine, run it back. Just have quick leashes, have short leashes, have that, have that cane ready to yank if you need it, because it's you're locked up on the right side, essentially. It would have to come down to those left defensemen that you just are hoping for the best. And mm -hmm. in terms of at least two of them, you're just going to keep hoping. I don't like that plan. Just point blank. Understandable. Out of it. I don't, I, I get, I get that that's seemingly what the plan looks like as mm -hmm. of right now. I don't like that plan because it's not like the Penguins were, oh, they were below average. And, and a lot of these players didn't play up to par. So if they all bounce back, you know, below average becomes above average and you're, you're set, right? But they weren't below average. Even down the stretch, this defense was not good. The final 14 games of the season, when the Penguins were winning almost every single game, the Penguins' defense was still 28th in expected goals allowed in the National Hockey League, 29th in goals allowed, 29th in scoring chances allowed, and 24th in high danger chances allowed. That is not below average. That is worst in the league defense, even when they were at their best seemingly last season. That is with Jack St. Ivany coming up and looking really good. That is with Eric Carlson playing some of the best hockey that he has played all season long. That is with P.O. Joseph showing the Penguins whatever he showed them to get them to still want to bring him back next season. That's a lot of hope, right? That's hope P.O. Joseph can turn into what you're hoping is a, a top four defenseman on this team. That is hope that you can get Ryan Graves, the Cody CC effect, where you put him on the third pairing with a reliable guy and you get him to bounce back and look like a top four defenseman that's playing in your bottom pairing. That's, that's what they're hoping for. But again, it is a heck of a lot of hope that you're banking on a team that wasn't anywhere near good enough. It's not that they just didn't play up to snuff. It's that they were playing poorly. It's why the assistant coach was fired. So the whole close your eyes and hope, bring everybody back and hope. I just, I don't like it. Do I see it happening? Yeah, mostly because the only other piece of the puzzle that's missing here is P.O. Joseph. And it, like we mentioned, who are they trading away? Nobody. The only thing they might, they might bring in another defenseman to try out with Chris Letang. But again, you have to get that right. 
If you're getting that on the open market, you're going to overpay. That's just what it's going to be for defensemen, especially a top four level defenseman this offseason. So it's going to be expensive. And then all of a sudden, you're paying Latang 6.1. You're paying Eric Carlson 10 plus. You're paying Ryan Graves 4.5. You're paying Marcus Pedersen 4 plus. And you're paying whoever this mystery left handed defenseman is, probably somewhere in the ballpark of $4 million again to play on that second pairing. All of a sudden, that's a lot of money, and if it doesn't work out, you're stuck in an absolutely horrible position. But at the same time, you look at what they have right now, and they really don't have any other options. So if there's any movement coming, if there's any change coming, it is to bring somebody in to test P.O. Joseph and Ryan Graves on that left side. Because as of right now, it's John Ludwig, and John Ludwig doesn't really battle with those two. And then it's it's Philip Crawl, who apparently is going to battle with John Ludwig for that final spot on the depth chart. Yeah, I was going to say, if you look at the options that the Penguins have, currently signed at least, on the left side, you're right. There's Philip Crawl, there's John Ludwig. If you wanted to dig deep, if you wanted to dig deep, and it would take some time, it would have to be an end-of-the-season situation. Owen Pickering, Isaac Beliveau might be making some movement i mean isaac belovo still needs to play above the echl level at a consistent rate so we'll see how that even goes when it comes to him as a prospect defenseman uh the jury is still out on the ufas that are down there i mean taylor fadoon had a couple of cups of coffee with the penguins i doubt that happens again uh who knows if dmitry simarukov earned and did enough to earn a new deal and then he comes up and actually plays in an nhl game he was recalled to you know be a healthy scratch so there is some sort of hey, we have this sort of confidence in you. I already mentioned Ryan Shea. That's a name that mm, who knows what happens there. And same with Jack Rathbone. Uh, who knows if they want to do anything there. Uh, the I could see a world where if they do add another defenseman that they're starting next season with Jack St. Ivany in the AHL again. It just to, again, continue experimenting with the defense a little bit to force – the hands of P.O. Joseph to elevate, to force this, that, the other. Maybe Philip Crawl is an NHL option. There's going to be all kind of new question marks that come up whenever, if uh, if and when P.O. Joseph resigns, because in my eyes, at least, that was the easiest name that you could have moved out. Yeah, and the only thing I, I say about like all those names you mentioned, which, yeah, some of them could be options that if there's injuries, they can fill in, but... They're all third pairing guys. Like none of these guys can play in the top four. At least none of these guys have proven, I should say. I don't want to, I don't want to dunk on these guys before they even get to the National Hockey League level, but none of these guys have proven that they can play in the top four of an NHL team. That's what the Penguins need right now because they're gonna try to use Ryan Graves on the third pairing because that is where he is best fit. He looked fine in his, I believe it was game and a half that he played with Jack St. Ivany down there. But again, it's a game and a half. Even St. Ivany's 14 game sample size is not enough to really guarantee what you're going to see from him next season. So the game and a half that he played with Ryan Graves, who knows? But history shows us if you take a top four defenseman, you put him on the bottom pairing with a reliable partner, he's likely to get some better play. We saw it with Cody Cece a couple of years back. That's why he signed a massive deal in Edmonton. Does it happen with Ryan Graves? I mean, he already has the massive deal, and that's what they're hoping for. They're hoping that it gets his confidence up. They're hoping that it gets his talent level to be back to what it was in New Jersey and Colorado. But there's nobody else to push, and that's the thing. Philip Carl's not pushing. John Ludwig's not pushing. P.O. Joseph is barely pushing. Like, he is, he's barely pushing, right? He's he's not going to be somebody that is undeniable. You can't take him out of the lineup. He's just not going to be that guy next year, even if he has some pretty good chemistry with a guy like Chris Letang. So, again... I think they might bring somebody in. And the only reason I think that they might add another name and then maybe have P.O. Joseph as your seventh defenseman and battling with the other two to try to get in on the left side. The only reason I think that is I feel like they're going so young on the forward side of things that they're going to have some extra money. They have so many league minimum contracts signed. Valtteri Pustin and Sam Poulin was signed to that earlier this year. They have a lot of young guys. Ponomarev and Koivunen are supposed to be battling for rules. If they save some money on the offensive side of things, they can maybe bring in that extra contract. But again, you have to, have to get it right. You can't miss that. Because if you miss that, all of a sudden, you're even further behind than you already were with one of the worst defenses in hockey this past season, spending more and more money on it. 
and, and that's just the last place you want to be if you're Kyle Dubas and the Penguins. Yeah, you got to find the money saving avenues, and it's, it's going. It's just going to be fascinating to see. Uh, I, I, like I said, I just didn't know what kind of changes they were expecting. You, were, I was mostly just looking at Ryan Graves. They're kind of locked into that. P.O. Yeah. Joseph, and now it seems like going to be locked into that. And I don't hate that the P.O. Joseph part of it. Um, we'll just see how it goes. It's going to be an interesting mm-hmm. camp. It's going to be an interesting preseason, and then that early season could be fascinating, especially with those names that could could battle especially if a new name arrives last thing before we move over here i 100 percent can see the po joseph contract going to arbitration that too that too it's just the way he was so off balance this year he was out of the lineup couldn't even get some playing time then all of a sudden he was a top six like a top four option playing with chris letang every single night i feel like there's going to be some inflated and deflated opinions on his performance and what he is owed for his next contract by him, his agent, and the organization. So I could definitely see that being a contract that finds its way uh, to arbitration. And then obviously, my, uh, Kyle Dubas mentioned it as well. He said, well, he's arbitration eligible, so it'll come to a conclusion one way or another. So to me, it feels like we're in for a long summer of waiting for the P.O. Joseph deal. Who was it last year? Oh, Drew O'Connor. Drew O'Connor. Um, and that we were wondering why, how that went to arbitration, considering... What he ended up getting? Not much. Sorry, I have to use the uh, soon-to-be-defunct cap-friendly to find this. No, come on, Puckpedia. I know. I had, to, I had to get the reference in there. Uh, <laughs> he, what, signed a two-year deal at $925,000? I mean, yeah. for what it's worth, if P.O. Joseph goes to arbitration, I think that's where you start looking. You start looking around what Drew O'Connor made and going down from there? <laughs> Maybe going know. a little up? Maybe just that exact thing again? fascinating stuff especially when it comes to arbitration because then it really becomes a guessing game for people like me and you yeah so we'll have to wait and see what happens on the po joseph front but at all intents and purposes it seems like he's on his way back to pittsburgh and at that point it's the same crew i mean there's something to be said for continuity but outside of that like you mentioned horwat it's a lot of hope and hope to me is not a good enough plan so we'll see uh, if there's a contingency built by kyle dubas over the next couple of months Let's finish this off by talking about the Stanley Cup final. Two games in the books. Florida Panthers take a 2 to nothing series lead with a 4-1 to one victory over the Edmonton Oilers last night at Amarant Bank Arena down in Sunrise, Florida. It was the Evan Rodriguez show in Game 2. 1-1 one, one tie going into the third, and Erod said, this is my time to shine, scoring his second and third goals of the Stanley Cup final already. You were talking about Carter Verhage. I'm talking about Sasha Barkov, who may or may not know where he's at at the present moment. It's Evan Rodriguez right now who's lighting up the Stanley Cup final. It's interesting. Uh, were you surprised that Erod came out in a big way in game two? Just like we all expected, Evan Rodriguez to have great uh, have great play in the Stanley Cup final on the second line like we discussed last time. Um, man, it, he's, it's, he's a fascinating character. He's a fascinating player considering... We know he can bring things like that to the game, but also at the same time has been very prone to just going stretches and stretches and stretches mm-hmm. without scoring. Good for him, man. Though This is awesome to see. Uh, and that first shot was unreal, especially off of the giveaway from Evan Bouchard, just straight to his stick and went from there. Please ignore my dog under the desk here. Uh, <laughs> not doing great, but he's getting by. Um, Evan Rodriguez was a fascinating game to watch yesterday too. I don't know what I expected from going into the series. He had, was mostly quiet through the first three rounds. He had that two goal game a little bit ago. It went nine games Um, without a goal. Then went nine, followed that up with nine games without a goal. And now, um, when the games matter the most, three goals and two games, Uh, I believe the first Florida Panther to ever have a multi-goal game in the Stanley Cup final. I mean, there's not a long list of games to pick from. Yeah. Uh, but that's still, for how good that team is, maybe they're back a couple more times if they can keep the group together. And if he's part of it, he's got his name first in the history book. So it'll be interesting to see. And right now he's, I wasn't expecting it. That's for sure. First in the history books for the Florida Panthers and could potentially be first in the history books for the NHL. Sean McDonough made sure to say it several times on the broadcast yesterday. The name Evan has not appeared on the Stanley Cup ever. And it will this year, whether it's Evan Bouchard or Evan Rodriguez, we'll see if Erod is the first Evan to have his name engraved on the Stanley Cup. Such a weird little tidbit thrown out there by ESPN. 
that's a fascinating one. I I love stupid things like that where it's like, what exactly did you? How did you figure that one out? Man? Yeah. How did you know to look for that? Yeah, and also I didn't I didn't even put two and two together that it was that it was Evan Bouchard giving that puck away to Evan Rodriguez. Um, what a fascinating series this is going to be. All, we discussed. I forget if this. I think this was after we stopped recording last game or last podcast. Game three is going to be the Connor McDavid show. Now yeah. they're down two nothing going back home. That crowd is not going to sit for the entire first two periods. Yeah, it's and it's going to be Connor. Just everyone get the puck to Connor. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially because he's been pretty quiet. Even last game last night after yeah. Sasha Barkov was taken out, the I mean McDavid had that breakaway chance, but he was stifled by Kachuk and Bobrovsky. So, I mean, yeah. you can argue what you want about the refereeing. It was bad on both accounts last night. So, you know, you both have to deal with it. It's the ref show. It always has been at the National Hockey League level. So, uh, you know, sucks for Oilers fans because they're down 2-0 in, in the first Stanley Cup final that they've seen in 18 years. But at the same time, I mean, are you new here? You know refereeing is awful. Did you expect it to change once you got to this level, once you got to the final? So, uh, the question then becomes, Horwat, and we'll close out the show with this. Do you think the Oilers have what it takes to take four of the next five games from the Florida Panthers and come back to win the Stanley Cup final? I don't know if they have what it takes. I think they could definitely secure a couple. Like I said, game three is going to be the Connor show, and mm -hmm. um, he might just win or lose in that one game, cement his con Smythe. <laughs> um, yeah. Because he's going to go off. He has no choice but to go off. Like, it, more than just it being Edmonton's first Stanley Cup final in 18 years, it is Connor McDavid's first Stanley Cup final. His first Cup final game at home. Mm -hmm. if, down to nothing, I think maybe it's a little scarier. Maybe you do try and make it more of a team game. But like like we were discussing, if they're going in up 2-0 or even 1-1, you sacrifice an L just to see if Connor McDavid can do some nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, this time, you're not going to be able to do as much sacrificing, but just get that man the puck, let him work absolute magic and just see what happens. At least for the first period. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that crowd's going to be unreal. It was, there were people talking about that Oilers crowd for game six against Dallas. Now you're in the Stanley cup final a for the first time in 18 years, B for the first time with Connor McDavid, maybe Leon dry not there. LOL JK player safety doesn't care. Um, it's, that crowd is going to be nuts. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking not, he can't hear the whistle nuts. Yeah. It's, I'm excited to catch that game and see what Connor can do. I bet they can steal one or two more of the next five. I don't know about taking four. Yeah. This feels like a, a split in Edmonton. This feels like Edmonton gets maybe that game three win and all of a sudden they're back in it. And then the Florida Panthers who are just the better team at the end of the day, the Florida Panthers take game four and it feels very similar to, what we saw Pittsburgh Penguins Stanley Cup Finals in 2016 and 17. They take games one and two. You feel really good. You change, especially in 2016. You change venues over to San Jose. Lost game three. San Jose won that in overtime. That was Jonas Donskoy's overtime winner. You take game four and you bring it back home for game five. And then it, it, it's a matter of when and not if the Florida Panthers close it out. Do they do it at home or do they do it on the road in game six? I feel like that's the book of this story, uh, the book of this series, the story of the series, whatever you want to say. Uh, can't talk 29 minutes into an episode. That's what it is. It's the middle of summer. Um, thinking about the pool, not about anything else. But no, it feels like it's going to be a split in Edmonton. And, and honestly, if Evan Rodriguez keeps going, I mean, he's probably he's not. He's not going to win the Con Smythe unless he continues to score two goals a game. But, you know, who knows? Maybe he's getting his name in there a little bit, even though Sergei Bobrovsky has given up one goal in this entire series. So yeah, Bob's going to end up stealing the con Smythe from everyone we've discussed. Yeah. Um, 100%. Especially yeah. if Barkov misses a couple games and they still Ooh, win. Yeah. It's, it's Bobrovsky's trophy to lose at this point. Yeah, for sure. We'll see what happens with that game. Number three in Edmonton, Thursday night, 8 PM on ABC and ESPN plus should be a good one. There should be an interesting week for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Some news to kick it off here with David Quinn's hiring. We still got some time here before 20 days, I believe, before the opening of free agency. So plenty of news to discuss, plenty of news to break between now and then. We'll keep you updated with all of it here at Inside the Penguins on YouTube and on Tip of the Iceberg anywhere you get your podcast from. But that's going to do it for this one. We'll see you guys next time. 